thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you again, Vishesh Baran, for inviting me. It's the second time you invite me to the Yashoda workshops. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor for me. So you asked me to, to give a talk about therapeutic management, endoscopic management of uh, benign uh, tracheal stenosis. And um, I, I have focused my talk on post-intubation and post-tracheostomy uh, tracheal stenosis, which in fact, whatever the cause of the tracheal damage is, uh, the same process uh, is underlying uh, all etiologies. You know, you have, uh, um, you have damages and a, a healing process that brings to uh, a stenosis. So, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm focusing on the on post intubation and, and post tracheostomy uh, stenosis, and we know from the literature that this um, stenosis uh, can uh, arrive in one to eight percent of intubation and tracheostomy, and above all, when you have the succession of intubation and tracheostomy. This is you know, the main background of, of, of the presentation. We know that surgery is a gold standard of the management, but I'm going to show you that endoscopy treatment uh, can be very useful for uh, inoperable patient or sometimes as a bridge uh, to surgery. Uh, when we look at uh, the patterns of uh, benign tracheostenosis following intubation and tracheostomy, uh, we know that uh, we have two kinds of uh, entities. We have what we call the simple tracheostenosis, uh, on the left side, uh, in other words, a mucosal disease, where you see there is just a web of mucosa and no cartilaginous damages. You see it on the, on the drawing, but you see also on the endoscopic image and on the CT scan image. Uh, in contrast, you have uh, on the right side, there is a complex tracheostenosis, uh, the intramural disease, where you have damages of the cartilaginous support of the airway. And uh, well, you have also an endoscopic image and a CT scan image on the left side, on the right side, sorry. What, what, what are the rules of, of management? Again, I insist on the fact that if someone can be operated, it, it has to be operated. Is it surgery is a treatment of choice. Surgery is a sleeve resection uh, with end-to-hand -end anastomosis of the safe um, uh, part of the, of, the, of the trachea. And is indicated, surgery is indicated for short and non-inflammatory tracheostenosis. And from the literature, we know that the success rate is, at least in the literature, above 90%. Uh, sometimes in real life, it's not as high as, as 90%. But we can remove up to five centimeters of trachea without replacement, but above five centimeters, then there is place for uh, tracheal replacement. And that's, uh, I would say, quite new area. And in France, there are different techniques, but one uh, has been well studied recently, which is aortic, uh, aortic graft. So you take a piece of aorta from cadavers and you uh, put it on the, in the trachea. And we know from animal studies and also human studies that after a while, this aorta get invaded by uh, cartilaginous cells and start to behave as a trachea. So it's very interesting. Uh, there is, in France, Professor Martineau, uh, close to Paris, who has worked a lot, if you are interested in that. But surgery cannot be sometimes afforded to everyone, because in this study from a French group uh, on 32 patients suffering from tracheostenosis, they, they, they have been looking at uh, comorbidities. And in fact, generally, when you're intubated or tracheotomized, it's because most of the time you have uh, comorbidities. And in these studies, only 25% of, uh, of the patient had no comorbidities that could uh, prevent surgery. Uh, so. Uh, that's important to know that all patients suffering from that can have comorbidities that can contraindicate surgery or maybe at least anesthe uh, general anesthesia. Sometimes it's just temporary, but sometimes it's definitive. So uh, endoscopic treatment uh, is very important. 
above all again for non-operable patients. And, and again, from this study, the French study in 1995, uh, same group of 32 patients, they, they found that 50% of the, of, of the patients arrived in emergency, so with respiratory distress. And surgery cannot be done in emergency in respiratory distress. So something has to be done before surgery. And this something is uh, an endoscopic management. And in, in, in a lot of patients, this uh, endoscopic treatment can be the definitive one in case of anesthetic or surgical contraindication. What we, 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 we know from the literature is uh, this bronchoscopy treatment produces immediate relief of symptoms. And if surgery has to be done, and it will be done in much better conditions. So uh, what are the main rules for the endoscopic management? So uh, now I'm, I'm focusing on the simple tracheostenosis, so the web-like stenosis. And uh, in 1993, Atul Mehta, you know, from Cleveland, has described a technique consisting in radial cutting of the web. So this radial cutting, as you can see on the, on the picture in the middle, uh, is uh, three incisions, one at 12 o'clock, one at three o'clock, one at uh, uh, nine o'clock. Of course, no uh, posterior incision because you have uh, the posterior membrane and the phagus behind. These cuttings are followed by dilation, this dilation can be performed by rigid tubes, as we do in, in, in Marseille and most, in most of the centers in France, and I think that you do the same in Yashoda. Uh, but it also can be performed with a balloon, uh, I mean, whatever the dilation. We prefer a rigid because we have a much better uh, tactile feedback from what we are doing with, with, a, with, a, with a rigid. This, uh, Technique can be repeated two or three times if necessary. In this simple tracheostenosis stent placement, um, uh, is not really the rule. It only very in uh, very limited cases, and um, and if there you have recurrences after uh, two or three sessions of dilation, then surgery is, in my in my opinion, the best option. Uh, Atul Meta with this technique described. Uh, a success of 66%, but more recently, in 2009, uh, Galluccio from Roma in, uh, in Italy uh, had much better uh, results, close to 100%, so 96%. So it's very efficient techniques. Uh, and in other words, this tracheal simple stenosis are in most of the time treated endoscopically, which is not the case of uh, the complex tracheostenosis, so the, uh, the intramural disease where you have cartilaginous damages. We know that first step will be dilation, but the dilation alone generally uh, is uh, associated with a high uh, percentage of recurrence, uh, close to 60 to 70 percent, because you have a loss of cartilaginous support. And generally, after dilation, uh, you have to splint. The, the, the trachea mm -hmm. with a stent. And we uh, highly recommend a removable stent. And I will explain you what means for me that removable stent. So which type of stents? When you look back at the literature, one of the first studies uh, in benign trachea stenosis was performed in Barcelona in Spain, a retrospe retrospective study with uh, 63 patients. You see the rate of complications uh, with uh, silicon stent, with uh, Dumont stent, uh, produced by Novatec in France. I know that there are probably many uh, copies in the world also of, of this stent, but whatever, the, it's silicon stent. Um, you see the complications, which were mainly migrations. And the stent was left in place 18 months. And in this series, uh, the definitive removal of the stent, meaning that uh, 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 after removal, no recurrence after one year of uh, after removal. And this uh, uh, definitive cure was uh, uh, reached in uh, close to 40%. A new silicon stent has been designed in the 200 uh, by Jean-Michel Vernon, which is a French physician. Uh, you know, the hourglass silicon stent, which was meant to treat hourglass tracheostenosis, and with aim to 
reduce the rate of migration. And this uh, objective was achieved in, in this uh, study only on 13 patients where uh, Jean-Michel Vernon found no migration with a mean follow-up of 23 months. What, what, what other silicon stent uh, can be proposed? So we have this study of, uh, of Tom Gildea in Cleveland in 2006 with the Polyflex. I don't know if you know this one. It's a uh, self-expendable uh, silicon stent. And he, he placed it not only in benign tracker stenosis, but in several uh, different benign uh, airway stenosis. Uh, as you can see, post-transplant, post trachomalacia, some, I would say, uh, disc discutable uh, indication like tracheobronchopathy uh, osteochondroplastica. Well, but in this uh, series, they had 75% of complication, most of the time migration. And uh, the conclusion of the study by the authors was that they abandoned this, the use of this tent in, a, in this indication. So basically, if you want to place silicon stent, the, the best choice is probably the, the Dumont stent. What about the metallic stent? 2006, a study from uh, America, United States of America, on 31 patients with ultraflex. And you know the ultraflex, as you can see in the on, on the on the photograph on the left side. Even when it's called covered, but you see the two tips of the stent are not covered. So it's not what we call a fully covered metallic stent. And so uh, in this study, they found a lot of granulomas, of course, at the two edges of the stent uh, with the colonization of, uh, of the metallic wires by the mucosa and migration very limited because of the uh, anchoring of, uh, of the two tips. Uh, something which is uh, specific of uh, metallic stent fracture, but very low. So basically a lot of granulomas, but obstructive granulomas. And in some pa patients, you know, when you wanted to treat a stenosis in the middle of the stent, you created two stenosis at uh, two edges of the stent. And so this is why the group, uh, the surgical group from Boston in America published in 2003 this uh, uh, this paper, uh, where they, they, they found that metallic stent, so in other words, the ultraflex, uh, but not only the ultraflex, also, uh, also the or, or uncovered stent uh, that existing, that were existing at, at that time, uh, metallic stent makes surgery impossible in 30% of the patients in which uh, surgery were possible at, at the beginning. So that's, uh, in, in other words, you can translate it in that metallic stent worsen uh, the primary stenosis and make it inoperable uh, after. So this is why in 2005, the FDA uh, published a recommendation. Uh, and this recommendation where, if I summarize them, that in benign tracheal stenosis, you have to exhaust all possible techniques before placing metallic stents. That means surgery, silicon stent. And if you really want to place uh, metallic stent, then you have to be very trained and experienced in that. So just to, to, to say that in 2005, after this recommendation, uh, we received in Marseille a lot, a lot of uh, uh, training, uh, requests for training, coming from America, because you know, the, the, when, when the FDA uh, uh, make uh, this kind of recommendation, you know, physician really wants to, <laughs> to follow the recommendation. And so they needed uh, a training in silicon stand placement, meaning training in rigid bronchoscopy. Uh, a paper from Mark Mopin from Belgium in 2005, where uh, on 49 patients, and he studied the removal of, uh, uh, the ultraflex in benign disorders, and he found that uh, only 26 removal were, were, were performed without major complication, meaning that uh, the vast majority were very complicated and at least required visual bronchoscopy uh, to, 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 be, to be achieved. But despite these uh, recommendations uh, in 2005, 
I, I was asked in 2011 to review a paper from a Greek group on, on where they studied, you know, the, uh, the ultra flex, the ultra flex of metallic stand, not fully covered uh, metallic stand in 11 cases. So my first reflex was to reject the paper uh, because uh, no, uh, how can we in 2011 still place ultraflex in benign conditions? But um, the, the journal has said, no, we, we could accept it, but you will make an editorial uh, to discuss it. And my editorial was airway stenting for benign tracker stenosis, what is really behind the choice of the stent. For me, the, the answer is quite easy. In fact, uh, the, when, uh, the, the, the answer is uh, the competency in really bronchoscopy. In other words, when you, when you know how to perform really bronchoscopy, then you can place whatever stents you, you, you want. And most of the time, silicon, because you, uh, silicon stents require rigid bronchoscopy to be placed. And only people who are not skilled in rigid bronchoscopy are still placing stents like ultraflex in benign condition because they are quite easy to be placed even with a flexible bronchoscope. But it's not because the stent is, it is easy to place that it has to be placed. Uh, and I insist on that. Uh, now, regarding metallic stent, we have a new generation. A lot of brands have, have come in, in the market, uh, brands from uh, China, Korea, uh, France, uh, United States, and a uh, few studies for in tracker stenosis, but just this one uh, in 2009 uh, from uh, Belgium with three centers, 17 patients, uh, different brands. You know, the Silmet is the French one, Tai Wong is the Korean one, Alveolus is, uh, was previously from Netherlands, but I think it's now in the, in the States. 10 uh, patients with tracheal stenosis, and a little bit like the study from uh, Tom Gildea with uh, Polyflex. They had a lot of complication, uh, and, and again, mainly migration. You know, unlike the ultraflex, there is no bare metal at the extremity, so you cannot really anchor the stent. But uh, I would say that both the study from Tom Gildea and this one, I found them a little bit unfair, honestly, because with any new stent, there is a learning curve, uh, a learning curve in which you learn probably the ideal indication for the stent, you learn the good diameter. So maybe at the beginning you have a lot of a complication, but if you, uh, if you uh, precise a good indication, then you, you reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, complication. And this is what we found with the French um, uh, fully covered metallic stent, which is, this stent doesn't look very nice, but uh, behave quite well. So in, in 2017, uh, uh, our group published this, uh, this paper on safety and efficacy of fully covered metallic stent in benign and western osis. And we, had, we, public, we, we studied in four years, uh, 13 patients with 14 uh, stents. Of course, we had complications, but no one was uh, life-threatening. Uh, all, all complications could be treated endoscopically. All the stent mass majority could be removed successfully, successfully and easily. And remember the, the paper from uh, uh, the, the American group with the Ultraflex and the, the paper from Mark Nopen of the difficulty to remove the Ultraflex. But in this case, it's very easy to remove. And we have a quite acceptable uh, success rate of 41%. Now, what about the long-term results of, uh, of the endoscopic management? So the first paper, uh, published in the European Respiratory Journal 1998, where uh, the endoscopic cure, and again, the definition is no recurrence of the, of the stenosis after one year, was achieved in 40%. Uh, stabilization with the stent in 44%, meaning that patient has to live forever with a stent in place. Surgery was proposed in 19%, uh, with some failure. So it's again, you no. Know, in the real life, sometimes it's not as high as 90% uh, of success. And uh, you see the stent complications, uh, obstruction, migration, granulomas. Uh, and I will probably repeat it, but uh, a stent is a foreign body, a foreign body in the airway. When you place a foreign body in the airway, you, you have to 
not expect, but uh, you have to, yes, you have to expect to, to, to face complications, but uh, I would say that uh, it is uh, acceptable. Um, but most important is that uh, the silicon stent does, does not worsen the primary stenosis and the, the study has proven it. This paper from uh, Sergio Cavaliere in Italy, uh, 2007, on 113 patients, with, this is a follow-up. And uh, in, this two, in this group of patients, they are included both simple and complex tracheal stenosis. And you see the success rate of the endoscopic management in simple tracheal stenosis, which was close to 90%. And for complex tracheal stenosis, uh, the definitive removal was achieved uh, on 22 patients. So, uh, the total rate of endoscopic cure was 66%, which is not that bad, in fact, for non operable patients. Uh, 18 patients had a permanent stenting, and 16% had the surgery performed. Uh, another study from Italy, Galluccio, Roma again. Much more patients, you see, 209 uh, patients. The vast majority were uh, simple tracheal stenosis only 42 complex tracheal stenosis. And you see in red the, uh, the rate of success, which was in, in, in simple tracheal stenosis close to 96%, and in complex tracheal stenosis was uh, 70%. Last one from a, a Turkish friend, Levan Dalar, who works in, 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 in Istanbul, a retrospective study in 132 patients you see success rate for simple tracheal stenosis is 100%, uh, and for uh, complex tracheal stenosis, again, this uh, rate of 70%. So for the long-term results of endoscopic treatment, for a simple tracheal stenosis, it's up to 100%, so almost all the patients are uh, uh, treatable by endoscopy, and in complex tracheal stenosis, it's close to 70%, which is not that bad, uh, which is not that bad. Some peculiar conditions. Um, there is something that is called pseudoglottic tracheostenosis or the dynamic A-shaped tracheostenosis. And you see this kind of stenosis is created by the uh, damage, rupture of uh, one cartilaginous ring or two sometimes in the anterior portion. Uh, and this uh, damage, damage, this rupture of the cartilage create a dynamic stenosis with, I would say, even with, when there is no damages on the posterior wall, but there is automatic bulging of the posterior wall. And this uh, tracheal stenosis is mainly symptomatic during expiration. As you can see on, on, the, on the picture, during inspiration, the, uh, the diameter can be uh, quite uh, good, but during after during expiration, there is a uh, collapse. So it's almost like uh, localized malacia. So that's different. Uh, it's a different pattern of tracheal stenosis. And you can now imagine that stenting this, uh, this uh, condition is uh, more complicated because you have uh, a changing diameter during inspiration and expiration. So we have published this uh, experience uh, in, from Marseille in 2015. And um, we have included 60 patients suffering from this kind of uh, disease. All patients, of course, had tracheostomy before. 55% uh, of, uh, of the patient had the posterior tracheomalacia uh, on the first evaluation. 22% uh, of the patient uh, had mild stenosis, and we decided that the balance uh, benefits, benefits risk were not in favor of, uh, of doing something, so we just, just make surveillance. Two were uh, referred directly to surgery, and endoscopic management was the first line in uh, 75%, so 45 patients. What was endoscopic management? So in, in some cases, uh, when the inspiratory diameter is, was good, we, we just applied laser on the posterior wall. Uh, this is something where we do sometimes in selected patient in Marseille, uh, we use laser to uh, retract, retract with a low power setting to retract the posterior wall and to, to, to tighten it and to, to make a fibrosis of the posterior wall. So some patients were treated like this. Some patients were treated with fully covered metallic stand 
and some patients were treated with silicon stent. So uh, the result of that is that migration mainly occurred with silicon stent, and they were much lower with, uh, with the uh, fully covered metallic stent. And one of the explanation is that with silicon stent, you cannot place more than 18, 18 millimeters, sometimes 20, but the highest silicon stent is 18. For metallic stent, you can place larger one. And this is what you can see. The metallic stent were, uh, uh, were generally larger than the silicon stent, and so were uh, remaining in place better than silicon stent. This migration is, is a problem. And, and, and uh, I like to, 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 to repeat that there is a stent, which we don't speak that much, you know, but which is very useful uh, in, uh, in, in practice is the Montgomery T2. Of course, the, well, the problem is more psychological uh, or aesthetical, uh, is that there is an external branch, you know, uh, that passes from uh, between uh, in the, in the tracheostomy orifice. But this stent is very safe because it doesn't migrate. You can, in case of complication of the stent, remove it easily because you have, you have a direct access to it. You just have to grab the external part and, and pull it. And so you can remove the stent. Uh, and it's very uh, well indicated in, in, in stenosis, very close to the vocal, close, uh, vocal cords, because in this location, the migration is very high. There's something very special, also a very rare indication that's from time to time, it's, uh, it can, could be an option. Uh, and, and we publish our experience uh, again in Marseille, but also with another group in France from Strasbourg. It is um, a transcordal uh, silicon stent. So in case of laryngotracheal stenosis or tracheostenosis, but involving the very close subglottic area, uh, and in inoperable patients, but even surgery is very difficult in this location, a stent can be placed uh, between the vocal cords. In fact, uh, the, the, if you place a stent in the trachea, in the trachea th you should uh, keep a, a safety margin uh, with the vocal cords, which is at least 10 millimeters. So the vocal cords have to be uh, at least 10 millimeters above the proximal edge of the stem. Otherwise, you can create a laryngeal edema and, uh, and, and, and suffocation, uh, respiratory, respiratory distress. But if you cannot have this safety margin, you can pass the stem through, uh, through the vocal cord, and then we don't have this uh, uh, laryngeal edema. Uh, of course, there are different complications, but generally limited and can be uh, also limited by some uh, uh, maneuvers which is uh, aspiration sometimes. There is no uh, uh, throat pain, uh, which was a bit amazing before, before I started to do it. Uh, so some aspiration, and this is, a, and of course, a whispering voice because you have a stand between the vocal cords. Yes, yesterday, yesterday I, I, I placed the first, uh, 3D printed T tube in this kind of indication, uh, and 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 uh, it's this solution can be uh, can be an alternative uh, to definitive tracheostomy. So, is there predictive factors for bronchoscopy success? On the short term, it's always success, successful, you know, always. Morbidity, mortality close to zero, constant subjective improvement of symptoms. You improve lung function, you improve the other score. And again, it's necessary in 50% of patients arriving in respiratory distress. For the mid and long-term results, I would say that uh, the result depends on the type of stenosis. I showed you that simple tracheostenosis are much amenable for definitive treat, uh, treatment, uh, endoscopic treatment, compared to complex tracheostenosis. The pseudoglottic tracheostenosis, uh, the one which is associated with localized malaria, uh, endoscopically, you cannot expect a definitive treatment because even when you place a stand after removal, the, 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 the instability of the, of the trachea uh, comes back. The location of the stenosis, uh, all uh, the, the location, you know, as you can see in red, the subglottic area involving the cricoid is the most tricky area, clearly. 
you know, there is this uh, orange uh, area in the mid, uh, in the cervical trachea, which is probably the easiest for both endoscopic and surgery. Uh, and the green one, uh, which is behind the sternum, uh, I would say endoscopically is not a big problem, but for the surgeon, uh, if you want to make a sleeve, uh, sleeve resection, you also have to do a sternotomy, which is a little bit more complex. The type of stents used, uh, silicone seems to be better uh, than, than metallic. Our glass seems to be better uh, to, to compare to straight silicone stent in above all in short stenosis. And the duration of the stent uh, left in place seems to be important. The more the stent is left in place, 18 months, the better are the results. So with 18 months, you can have close to 70% of success. And with six months only of placement, it's, it's closer to 40%. And so factors that we don't really know, uh, that, not, that has not been very well studied, are the, I would, what I call the patient-rated factors. In other words, if you take two patients with the same stenosis and you place the same stent in both, one patient will behave, uh, will, will tolerate the stent very well and will come back after one year for removal, while in contrast, the other one after three weeks will come back with granulomas, with obstruction. And it's not, we cannot blame the stent, which is the same, uh, but clearly there are factors related to the patient that uh, or maybe genetics, immunological, inflammatory, uh, that um, probably explains the tolerance uh, of the stent. This is a therapeutic algorithm of the management of, uh, of benign tracheal stenosis. So you make a bronchoscopy and then you have two patterns. So simple tracheal stenosis, web-like. You cut, dilate, so you can use laser or even rigid scissors, you can repeat it. Most of the time you have a stabilization and you follow the patient. But in case of a third recurrence, you have two options. The better is the surgery and the other option is stenting. For complex tracheal stenosis, now the rule is to avoid stenting if surgery can be, can be done. So you, you dilate and then you refer the patient to surgery. If the patient is not operable, then you place a stent. If after removal, there is no recurrence and you follow the patient. If after removal, there is a recurrence and in the meantime, uh, the patient uh, uh, is now operable, then you send the patient to surgeons. And again, if the patient is not operable, then you have to replace the stent. This is probably the, the real life of what we have to do. But again, I insist on the fact that uh, in complex tracheal stenosis, in the past, in the past, the algorithm was a little bit different, where because stenting was the option, first option, but now this dilation and surgery, if surgery can be performed. Uh, so my conclusion is that it's always important to repeat things that uh, surgical civilization of the trachea is the gold standard in the management. Over five centimeter, that's the place for trachea replacement. Endoscopic treatment is used in emergency and for non-inoperable patient or as a temporary bridge. You have all, almost always spectacular symptoms relief. It's a very efficient neoadjuvant treatment before surgery and acceptable palliative treatment in non-operable patients. But, uh, and I insist on that, you place a frame body in the airway, so you will have to probably uh, face complications, solve them, and you have to also to remember that uh, a stent requires maintenance, a daily maintenance with uh, mobilization of saline. Uh, and some patients find, can find that uh, a little bit boring to, to do the nebulization three times a day, but it's, it's, it's mandatory to avoid obstruction by secretion. Removable stents are the best option, meaning silicone stent and fully covered self-expandable metallic stent. So fully covered and the stents require close clinical maintenance due to possible but rare life threatening complications. So this is uh, the conclusion of my, my talk. And, um, and my last slide is to maybe uh, recall you or uh, advise you that uh, we are 
we'll, uh, we will organize a World Congress for Bronchology and International Pulmonology in Marseille. The previous one was in, in Shanghai. So this is a very important event, in the, the most important event in International Pulmonology uh, in the world. It will be held this year in October. October is a very uh, uh, good uh, period of the year in, in Marseille. It's not too, too hot and it's still uh, very pleasant with the sunny days. So we expect some of you will, will join us. You'll be very welcome. Thank you.